Mr. Regal. All right, I'd like to call the regularly scheduled Board of Finance meeting for Tuesday, February 16, 2016, to order. Uh, first order of business was to have been received the audit report of, uh, for fiscal year 2014-2015, um, and Bruce Shapiro was going to be presenting, uh, give us an overview. We have the documents, we're, or some of us got them at the, uh, I guess, the second uh, the, uh, selectman's hearings on the budget. Uh, in either event, if they show up here, we'll pop them back into the agenda. They will give us the overview, and then uh, for those who haven't had a chance to review the stuff, we can uh, certainly submit written questions to them, uh, and they can respond uh, and share them with all of us. Uh, item two, public forum. Uh, my hope is that there will be more folks at public forum the next time we meet, which will be our budget hearing. Um, so uh, there doesn't appear to be anybody from the public. Uh, item three, and that would be 3.1, regular meeting minutes, January 19th, 2016. Uh, is there a motion to approve those minutes subject to discussion and changes? So moved. Second. Second. Uh, comments, questions, additions, etc. cetera. Um, a typo on page two. I'm not sure what this is. Page two, one, two, three, fourth paragraph from the bottom. Or maybe it's just an abbreviation. Actually, it's, it should be Ms. Trudeau, so there's that. And then said she has Benny, a Benny meeting? What's Benny? Ben. Beth? Ben's Ben meeting. No, Ben meaning B-E-N. Ben. Oh, has been. oh, has been. Ben. I'm sorry, <laughs> Ben. Okay, I thought we were you know, working no. on our Italian or something. <laughs> All right. All right. Federici, Fed what's it? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what it meant. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's it. Anybody else? I had one uh, that was on. It was uh, item eight under committee reports on page seven. Uh, Ken, I don't know whether you got a satisfactory answer to the uh, large dirt pile at Baldwin School. Uh, I've gotten an answer that's it's still pending. Okay. Thanks for asking. Okay. Right, Mike, we're still... Mike? You gave me an answer and I questioned it and you were going to give me additional information. Uh, as, as far as I know, the answer still is that the topsoil, a lot of the soil that was stripped from the site originally beginning of the project was, was over there, um, was stored. Uh, they are slowly taking that dirt and that soil, bringing it back to the site, and whatever's left over is going to be in towns. Uh, for use, um, but it's not at all from the remediation or anything like that. Okay. So, but the question remains think, unanswered. We'll talk about. I think one of your comments, one of your comments, was uh, regarding the, um, the the dryness of it, and it was very dusty over there. No, it was the. Do we really want to talk about this now? Sure, sure. Right. Um, it's a large area. There were several large piles, and yep. they were screening it and going through it and uh, it apparently it has been going on for a week or so, and now it's completely gone. Mm -hmm. And that's probably because they've been taking that soil and bringing it back to the site as film for the site. Yeah. So, and it, it looked like good, there was one pile of good dirt and two piles of presumably bad dirt. The, the, some of it, the, the, the I think quote unquote bad dirt was probably substrate and then the top. So when you say bad, it's just substrate. It's not topsoil. And what kind of trucks might one have seen coming and going? What name on them? I have no idea. Contractors. Yeah, we'll talk about it later. Okay. Cool. All right. Anything else? I'm not convinced at all. I'm back to the high school. Okay. Uh, anything else on the minutes? Call a question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Recusals? No. All right, why don't we go back uh, and move uh, to the audit report. Um, if you guys wouldn't mind coming up, Nicoletta uh, McTighe, and I think it's Jonathan DeAngelo. I'm sorry for being a few minutes late. That's okay. We got stuck back roads with a very foggy day. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I came down 77 myself earlier this evening. Yeah. An interesting ride. It was a very interesting ride. Um, Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, as part of the audit, we issued several reports. 
we should the comprehensive uh, or Catholic comprehensive annual report, uh, state and federal civil audit, and we should deliver to the Board of Finance that summarizes what we did during the year. Um, not going to go page by page no, for the report. No, highlights, please. <laughs> but I'm just going to highlight a few things, uh, especially the new things that were reported in the current year. The uh, I'd like to start off with the comprehensive annual financial report, Catherine, and. Um, the format of the CAFR is exactly the same as in the prior years. Um, I would like to start out with the opinion on page one of the financial statements. Um, so opinion report is uh, on pages one, two, and three. And really the most important uh, paragraph is on page two, page opinions, opinion paragraph. Um, and basically, uh, the town received an unmodified opinion, which is a clean opinion, uh, on its basic financial statements. And um, the following paragraph, change in accounting principle, um, identifies the new accounting principle that were implemented in the current year, which is GASB 68, the pension accounting and reporting. As a result of implementation of GASB 68, we um, restated beginning balances for the net position of governmental activities on Exhibit 2, um, but we did not uh, modify our opinion because of that restatement. So basically what the restatement was is bringing in at the beginning of the year the net pension liability as of June 30th, 2014, so that reduced um, the net pension and net position um, for the town. Uh, following the basic financial statements, our required supplementary information. Um, the required supplementary information, uh, based on the name, is required to be put in the report. We do not provide an opinion on the required supplementary information, which are management discussion analysis um, and um, pension schedules, uh, but they are uh, part of the um, report. In addition to the required supplementary information, there is other information that provides more detail on the town's, um, let's say, special revenue funds or capital project funds. Uh, but they, again, we look at those uh, other funds in relation to the basic financial statements. We do not give a separate opinion on that. Um, again, as I said, I'm going to just highlight two things. So I'd like everybody to go on page um, 14, if you'd like to follow along. And that's uh, the statement of net position. Uh, this statement, along with statement exhibit two, statement of activities, are prepared on full accrual basis of accounting. And uh, governmental activities includes uh, every single fund, governmental fund in the town, with the exception of uh, trust and agency funds, so with the exception of uh, pension trust funds. Business type activities uh, includes all the um, enterprise funds in the town. The governmental activities ended um, the year with a uh, net position of $44.7 million. Um, business type activities, $1.3 million. And for combined, um, $46 million, which was an increase of $12 million um, in comparison with prior year. What's new uh, for this year on Exhibit 1? Um, under Deferred Outflows of Resources section, somewhere in the middle of the page, we have char charges, changes in projected actuarial experience and changes in projected investment earnings. Both items are related to changes in net pension liability, and those are items that eventually are going to be amortized and recognized as expenses for the governmental activities over uh, a period of five or six years, and that is explained in more detail in the notes of the financial statements. Included in the liabilities uh, under section non-current liabilities due in more than one year. Um, this year, there are $3.2 million in net pension liability um, that are reported for the first time. Last year, they were just in the footnotes of the financial statement. This year, the liability of $3.2 million um, is reported in the front. So this was uh, basically a change from the prior year um, because of the implementation of uh, new gas is about pension uh, reported. Exhibit three um, is where all the major or governmental funds are presented, uh, and they are general fund, budget projects, high uh, school construction, 
and under non-major governmental funds column are all the special, all the other governmental funds that, uh, that are not big enough to be uh, considered uh, major funds. Governmental, um, uh, all the governmental funds ended um, with a negative fund balance of uh, $33.9 million, and that's mostly because of the bonded projects on high school construction had a $17.3 million and $28.9 million, respectively, in, um, in a negative fund balance. And that is because uh, the town has um, co is continuing to fund uh, those projects with uh, short-term notes, uh, um, bond anticipation note payable, as opposed to uh, have a, a bonding, so part of those projects. For some, there is bonding, for, uh, for um, the other ones is uh, short-term financing. Uh, so once the, the long-term financing um, comes in, that um, deficit fund balance will be eliminated. What were the two numbers you said, 17 and what? Uh, $17.3 million and $28.9 million negative fund balance. That's on page 16. Okay. And as you can see on the liability section, we have uh, Bonds anticipation not payable of $16 million in bonded project fund and $24 million in the high school construction. If um, uh, permanent funding was done for those two funds, the um, fund balance would be looking differently. Um, general fund ended uh, with a total fund balance of $8.9 million, of which $6.8 million is unassigned fund balance and that represents 7.16% of the general fund expenses on GAAP basis, which are reported on um, page 18. Um, on page 17 is a reconciliation between um, fund financial statements that are on page 16 and government-wide financial statements that we, I talked about, I started talking on page 14, that are on full, full accrual basis. So basically, what this reconciliation does says that this is what fund balance is uh, for governmental funds. Let's add all the long-term assets and long-term liabilities and come up with a net position on a full accrual basis of accounting. Because for governmental funds, long-term assets and long-term liabilities are not reported, but they are reported on the government-wide financial statement, which is made on, um, it's prepared on uh, using a full accrual basis of accounting. Uh, exhibit 4 on page 18 um, reflects the statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance for all the major funds. Um, nothing of note in this um, exhibit unless you have uh, questions. Again, following that exhibit on page 19 is a reconciliation of change in fund balance of $9.4 million, and they're putting that. Um, in perspective, using a cruel base of accounting to give us a change in net position of $12.2 million. So basically, uh, the reconciling items are changes in long-term assets and liabilities that will affect um, the change that we have in modified base of accrual with full accrual base of accounting. Um, exhibit five is a budget and actual uh, schedule for general fund. Uh, the town, um, received um, $720,000 more in revenue than budgeted and spent um, $498,000 less than budgeted. Uh, and then for the year, the town ended with an excess of revenues and other sources of expenditures of $1.2 million. So I ended on the positive note. Uh, following the, the budgetary statement, we have business type activities. Um, the same funds as before. Um, we did not, there were no new funds in this section. Um, the change in the net position for business type activities is on page 22. Um, there is a slight decrease on change in net position for all government, for all business type activities of $176,000 for the year. And internal service funds, um, the net position increased by $665,000 for the year, which is on page um, 22. Um, so these are the, the governmental fund financial statements. 
and they are followed by the trust funds. In the trust fund section on page 24, we have pension trust funds and agency funds. Um, pension trust fund ended the year with $52.6 million in net position, which um, that was an increase of 3% or $1.4 million in comparison with prior year. And the change in the uh, net position for the patient trust funds is shown on page 25. Um, so this concludes the exhibits that are followed by the notes to the financial statements. Um, the notes are consistent with prior year with exception of two of them. Um, the, the pension disclosures that are on page, starting on page 42. And the restatement that is uh, out of there. Um, the, the only really true change in this footnote is on page, starting on page 46, where now uh, we are required to present the changes in the net pension liability for the year, and that is given for each plan. So uh, the employee special plan um, started with a, a total pension liability of um, $19.2 million in fiscal year 14 and ended at $19.8 million. Reduced by the plan fiduciary net position, the net pension liability at year end is $254,000. Um, for the police retirement plan on the, on the following page 47, uh, the net pension liability increased by $566,000 from $1.2 million on June 30, 2014 to $1.8 million in um, June 30th, 2015. The same presentation is reported for the uh, public school employees pension plan where the liability increased by $889,000 from $194,000 to uh, a million one. An important disclosure in uh, the pension is the sensitivity to, of the net pension liability uh, to the changes in discount rate for the current year, the discount rate that was used was 7%. If the rate was 1% lower at 6%, the liabilities will be a lot higher. And if it was uh, the rate, the discount rate was 1% higher at 10, 8%, we'll have the unattention asset. So this is just to give um, the readers of the financial statement an idea of what 1% change will do to the disclosures of the numbers. And again, uh, the discount rate is an estimate that's used, um, which is approved by the management. But if a different rate was used, a different result will be shown in the financial statements. Um, so this, this basically is the, the biggest change that happened in the financial statement presentation for, um, for the year. Following on page 50, for the first time, now we'll see the deferred inflows and outflows uh, related to changes in the net pension liability. For the town, all three plans reported only deferred outflows of resources. And on page 51, uh, the amortization of those um, deferred amounts is reported by year. Uh, the requirements that you report the first five years and then thereafter you plug the number. You, you, not the, the plug, but it's a difference, yes. Um, teacher's retirement plan, pension plan, This. Before, we used to have only one paragraph in the footnote. Now, it's about uh, four pages. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's all um, to fill the requirements of New Gatsby. Um, the most important like, section that you might want to see here is on the middle of page 52, uh, which shows the state proportionate share of the net pension liability associated of the town, with the town of $67.5 million. So this is liability that shows in the state's books, not in the town's books. For the town, it's just a presentation in the notes to the financial statements. The town has no liability related to that $67.5 million. This is just information on it. Um, and um, again, the rest of the information is very consistent with prior year. I'll answer any questions, specific questions that you might have. 
And uh, the very last note of the uh, report, uh, note 8, is prior period adjustment and restatement. And this note is detailing all the changes that we made to the beginning net position um, of the governmental activities. Uh, the, uh, the adjustment for GASB 27, uh, there was $3.4 million reported as uh, net patient liability and $4 million uh, reported as net patient asset. Uh, so they both got out of the books and we brought in the uh, net pension um, asset for one plan and then two other plans at the beginning of net pension liability of $1.4 million. I explained those numbers um, a few pages earlier. So um, the net position at June 30, 2014 uh, was revised from $34.1 million to $32.5 million at the beginning of the year. Um, there was a, another <coughs> adjustment made under non-major governmental funds to bring in um, the balances for the volunteer fire, which they were not reported um, in the past. Um, so these are the basic financial statements. Um, it's a really good information to look at if you want more uh, detail on the pension plans are the required supplementary information. For now, um, we give only two uh, only two years are presented in there, but uh, those schedules eventually are going to be presented 10 years uh, worth of information, so this way we can see the progression from year to year of what happened with a total pension liability, with uh, 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 the net position of the uh, trust funds and the, the net pension liability over the years and the percentage of funding. So it's going to be, um, over the years, a very good analysis of what happened for every single plan. Um, the same way with the contributions, um, for, we had the information for 10 years, so it's presented for 10 years, and the annual money weighted rate of return and of investment expense, the same thing uh, is going to be for 10 years. Um, so that, uh, these are the highlights that I wanted to bring to your attention. Okay. Um, do you want me to move on? Or uh, questions? Anybody have any questions on the comprehensive? Report. As I stated earlier, uh, we'll entertain some questions uh, at people's leisure and submit them to you guys in writing. Okay. Yeah, move on to the single state single audit, federal yes. single audit. And I'll have John um, summarize, uh, give the highlights of the uh, state and federal single audit. Uh, John Badangelo, I was an yeah. audit manager on the engagement <coughs> this year. I'm going to apologize in advance of getting over all the cold. This, okay. These temperature fluctuations are killing me. Um, <laughs> So this is pretty straightforward, uh, very similar to prior years. Uh, first couple of pages of your title page, and then your table of contents. <coughs> so the major areas that were, are in our report. Are you doing the state and the bedroom? Uh, let me start with the state, and then we'll move on to the federal side of um, The first three pages are basically our audit opinion on the grants themselves that were tested. And we're issuing an unmodified or clean yeah. audit opinion. You know, some deficiencies, no material weaknesses no question costs, anything along those lines. Um, so the rest of this wording is basically our standard audit opinion wording. If you have any questions on the wording, as you read through, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, starting on page four through page six are your schedule expenditures. Um, it's broken down by each state grantor, and then below that is each individual grant, uh, and then summarized as a subtotal. On page six is your total state expenditures of $21.2 million. That's pretty consistent with what you've had year over year. Um, only s small changes, I guess, is the dredging uh, grant that you guys expended this year and you guys expended for a couple of years, every two to three years. Uh, and then you guys got a small $127,000 for the wiring grant that you expended this year. Um, of that $21.2 million on page five, there's a total of financial assistance for except programs of 3.1. Basically everything that makes up that 3.1 is what we consider for testing based on state requirements. Um, if you guys have any questions as you guys go through the expansion listing, please feel free to, to reach out. But basically it's pretty consistent year over year with what you've had. The, the significant contributor to that report is the uh, school construction grants, yep. obviously, for us. Yep, and those are exempt for our testing test purposes. Um, the, uh, the state test was... Um, At the end of the project, done. yeah. They have, they'll come in and make sure that we did it right. Correct. <laughs> um, 
following that is just basically our footnotes. Nothing. This is just pretty consistent year over year. Uh, just requiring our footnotes. Um, starting on page eight is our audit opinion over your internal controls or financial reporting, which again we're issuing an unmodified and clean audit opinion. And it's pretty standard wording. Um, page 10 is basically our summary of everything we just ran through. Uh, again, issuing an unmodified report, no significant deficiencies or material weaknesses. Um, down below is a listing of the grants that we tested this year. Uh, so we tested the County Road, lots of uh, the dredging program, the local uh, road and bridge program. So we tested roughly uh, 2.3 million of that 3.1 million based on our risk assessment approach. And so we got pretty significant coverage. No real issues to report. So I, I just want to uh, add one more thing on the um, last report that's uh, listed here on page on page eight. That's the independent auditor's report on internal control over financial reporting. As part of our audit, we uh, look at the internal controls, we test them, but we do not give an opinion on internal controls. But if there are any significant deficiencies or material weaknesses, that's where they will be reported. And uh, the town does not have any significant deficiencies or material weaknesses to report, so it's a clean report. And the same report actually is bound with a federal yeah, single audit report because it's a requirement. But so we won't repeat the same thing. John will just go over the programs and the findings. For I kind of went through that really high level, so that's right. if you have any questions as you're through, please feel free to chat to me. Um, like Nicola mentioned, this is the federal single audit report is very similar to the state. Um, it starts with the table of contents and it runs into our opinion on each individual grant. Uh, we're issuing an unmodified or clean audit opinion. Um, we did identify one item that we considered significant deficiency, but we didn't consider that material weakness, so it didn't change our audit opinion. But we'll run through that quickly in the back as we move on. Um, pages four and five are your scheduled expenditures. 1.3 million is pretty consistent with what you had in the past. I think you had 1.5 million last year, which is just the same grants, just slowly going down, unfortunately. Um, but again, this is broken down by grantor, and it's broken down by grant. And in the federal grant, it's also broken down by year, so you might have multiple year grants in there. So it's also broken down by fiscal year. Um, Followed by the footnotes. Again, some are footnotes. The only difference is the non-cash awards, which we're required to add to our uh, to our opinion, which is the uh, school lunch program commodities that you got. Nothing really significant going on. Page six, page seven, eight are so all the report that we just talked about over internal control of reporting. And page nine again is our summary. We're wishing we're issuing an unmodified clean opinion. Uh, we had one item we consider significant, significant deficiency, um, and that was in the special education cluster, which is what we tested. Uh, I think it was like 670, that, I think we covered about 50% of your total expenditures and grants. Um, so basically, uh, as far as the significant deficiency goes, it uh, related to the ED111, which is your grant drawdown reports, okay. and then your ED141s, which is your grant uh, expenditure reports. I just want to make sure I stress that we tested both these reports, there are no issues, no question costs, no uh, changes made. Okay. We're just suggesting that um, a stronger control process be put in place over those that an independent person reviews after it's approved, which I believe have already has happened since since so, so this is, this has been shared and addressed. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. We, we separated the duties now so that one person is doing the grant request. Right. And when that request goes in, I review it first. And then the final ED 141s will be done by me, separate from the person's doing that. Which will, so this will go in. That will satisfy, yeah, yeah. definitely. This is perfect. And um, the, the last report that I'm going to go very quickly is the letter to the Board of Finance, yep. um, uh, which is, um, we refer to as SAS 114 letter because that's when it's required um, for us to communicate. Um, the letter starts out by um, listing all the, the major management estimates that are uh, in the report. Um, starting with net pension um, asset or liability. Uh, those um, liabilities were, uh, estimates were used which were um, approved by the management. 
Um, there are several other, other estimates included. They have to do with post-employment um, benefit liabilities, um, uh, the life of the capital assets, uh, use in the governmental um, activities and uh, business type activities, um, and um, some a couple other estimates related to allowance for doubtful um, accounts. Estimates are always part of preparing financial statements. You can't get away from them. We just have to disclose which ones they are. We did not have any difficulties um, encountering, uh, didn't encounter any difficulties in performing the audit. This audit went, um, as you can tell by the date, was uh, on time. Uh, huge improvement from the past. Uh, kudos to Sheila and her staff, and to Joe and Linda at the Board of Education. Um, there were no uncorrected misstatements uh, to be reported. We did not have any disagreements with management. Um, management for both the town and the Board of Education signed representation letters. Uh, we did not consult with any other accountants um, while we did our audit, and we did not have any other uh, findings um, or issues to report. Um, so this, uh, this is, um, I'm pretty sure everybody read the letter, this is the summary of what I wanted to highlight uh, in our presentation today. Thank you. Any questions at this time? We'll reserve the right to submit some questions in the... In Definitely. The yeah, I have time. Wonderful. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. I appreciate the presentation as well. Um, I think it, 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 Nicoletta did indicate that this uh, uh, audit was completed within the traditional timelines. With traditional no, timelines. No extensions no. Uh, uh, needed or asked for. So my congratulations both to the finance offices of the Board of Education, Board of Selectmen, and your staff for ensuring that uh, we met those deadlines. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> and uh, travel carefully back up that uh, foggy road. Wait, Appreciate it. <laughs> 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 Thank you. On to item four, correspondence. Uh, all we have is uh, because there were no uh, standing government committee meetings in the minutes because they canceled their February meeting. Uh, so we have a pension committee. Uh, any comments, questions, etc.? I had none. Anyone else? Peter, you have a couple things circled there? Or? Well, I, I just looked at the range the minimum 3% cut from contribution, maximum wage, and of course, if uh, you know, if we're in the performing, we have to contribute more. And of course, the interesting part was the fact that the Cadillac tax would be a 2.5 thousand grade, I guess. Or 45 million. Is that million? It yeah, should, it's be, it should be It should be two, two M's then. Yeah. <laughs> M is a thousand. Yeah. Used to be. <laughs> the old math. Right. Yeah, so that's, that's a lot. I mean, we have to obviously do everything we can, but right. um, the Cadillac tax is you rescind it, and we can. Yeah. Any others? Move on. Item five. Uh, you and the accept report of expenditures for the Board of Education for January 2016. Linda and, uh, and, and the chairman. Let's see. In the rotating seat. Well, uh, I will say. Are you pinch hitting? Yeah, I am. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Moore was actually uh, doing the review of the the expenses this month, but we didn't actually have a meeting because of the snowstorm. And so, uh, uh, and Dr. Moore was unable to be here this evening, so I will, uh, uh, so I neither, have, I have the documents, but I neither have had the benefit of a report, nor, no preparation. I, or, nor, nor did I have the opportunity to go through the bills individually as we usually do, but I can at least tell you, it, just in, in, I think at this time of year, you, you generally want to know, are we, are we within our budget? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, we're going to, as usual, we're going to have to do some transfers on, uh, more than likely. Uh, we're going to have to try to, we'll, we'll, we'll have to try to save in some, some of the seven columns that the General Assembly has, has uh, directed us to uh, account in. Uh, but uh, we think we're going to be okay. And, and as, as is always the case with two-thirds through the year, we're going to have to be a little attentive and creative, but that's fine. That's, that's, there's nothing unusual about that. Um, the total expenditures for the month of January were $4,585,951.61. Uh, you do have uh, breakouts in terms of um, uh, some of the various areas. Uh, we are, um, 
obviously a little more than halfway through the year in terms of the budget situation. Uh, so we, we have a decent level of uh, familiarity with what we think things are going to line up with at the end of the year. And it, it's, it's just nothing out of the ordinary. There are some categories that are going to be above what we thought, and there are going to be some that are below what we thought, and at the end of the day, we're going to be within budget. So if there are specific questions on any of the warrants, I'll be happy to defer them to uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Some of them may be to them correctly. Um, yeah, but on the, uh, just on the uh, general expenditures uh, for the month, at uh, this point, clerical building is at 40%, significantly below, uh, and my understanding is most clerical don't work during the summertime, uh, during July, June, July, August, or... So that number just seemed awfully low to me. 40%. We may need to look into it and get back to you. There was one clerical position that we have left unfilled this year, but I'm not sure if that would be significant enough to generate the That would be a part of it. That would be, that would be a significant component. That would be 4% of it or so, okay, something yeah. like that. <clears throat> uh, also, uh, just, uh, you know, these, these, these are line items that obviously you guys need to go to when you have to move and account uh, for overages, but uh, travel is way down this year at 15%. And then uh, I think we talked about telephone at the last meeting. Uh, in the U.S., uh, there are grants that are driving that. Uh, right. Well, there's also um, an issue with trying to we're trying to resolve with the telephone bills. Um, so right now we're a little behind because there's a problem we're trying to straighten out. I think we found we figured it out last week and got it taken care of. So that'll that'll be, be reversed then. Yeah. A little higher next month. Okay. A little higher. But the last one I had was uh, on uh, heat. Um, the past several days, not notwithstanding, we have enjoyed a relatively mild winter. Uh, but at you know 28 percent, that number is dramatically lower than we now. And now, obviously, there are some things in there too, in terms of cost of uh, oil. And well, so remember the high school has gone from uh, from not electricity to electricity. Right. And so uh, that, that, that uh, it, it, this is one of these areas where comparing budgets year to year is going to be really a, a, a lot of variables this year. So yeah, it's, it's, it's just not going to be as meaningful as it might have been in some years past. Having said that, oil is pretty cheap right now. Well, having yeah, said that too, electricity is so still running at, at less than 40% as well. So the, the, the overall good news is uh, you know, utility consumption it seems to be down. Okay. And the more efficient building that we're still learning. And so yes, lots of variables. As, as I recall from our uh, our uh, budget subcommittee meetings, it was that was it. That's anticipated in the next year as well. Right. Those are areas where you're. Well, in. we'll have uh, you know clearly we're going to have a much better uh, set of data points uh, in next year's budget than this year's budget. On the other hand, you know we we used the predictions for the energy. A task force and the architects and the building committee uh, believe were fair estimates, but they're estimates, and we're going to—they're not going to be off by much. I mean, but we'll, we'll be on. Right. We'll just have better information next year. Yeah. I'll, re I'll release the monopoly on these questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Mike, um, last month I had brought up the safety, sanitation, and upkeep the buildings and grounds. The good news is that it doesn't appear that it's shifted at all. Um, some of the bad news is there's still a lot of encumbrance. And I know, Linda, you had mentioned that there might be some <coughs> possibilities of canceling some of those encumbrances. Do you have a status on that? Yeah, we canceled, I don't have the dollar amount, which we canceled um, a number of them, and we're still looking at canceling some more. Um, I can give you a better update and send it out. But okay. It, it's still going to be over by the end of the year. But we're trying to minimize the effort. And my other question was on capital. Um, I did read in the meeting minutes, and I think it was alluded to last month as well about Baldwin. There was a lot of issues with the HVAC at Baldwin. A lot of repair work that had to get done, um, whether it was maintenance, repair, or both. Um, so the capital seems to be much higher. Are there, are there any specific concerns regarding? What Baldwin did to the capital budget. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, right now they're trending it around uh, capitals. Now, of course, that includes also non-instructional, or I'm sorry, equipment instructional, which is the computers and the technology. Yeah. Um, 
Um, so that is typically a timing issue that you just you spend it. But um, the site improvements is at 80, so it's a total of about 83, 84 percent. So. You know, the Baldwin repairs were not something that we were anticipating not at all. in the beginning of the budget year, obviously. Right. On the other hand, it's like the, the year we had trouble with a, with an oil. You know, you don't really have a, you they can't wait for the next budget year. Right. And so that's just something we've had to move. Uh, so that may, that may go over, but again, it'll be a transfer issue exactly. later on. Exactly. Okay. And for the level of disruption, the repairs didn't rise to that level of magnitude and dollars. They're, they're, it, it disrupted a week of school, and it was another one of the cold snaps. Yeah. Um, but the repairs, generally fell within tens of thousands of dollars, not hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it shouldn't create big damage to the budget protection. Um, I hope this isn't a redundant question, but so those are, there, there's a comment in the uh, operations committee minutes, the review of the monthly reports, that Burnham addressed the utility expenses at the schools. And he says he stated that some of the schools have older heating systems that don't function as efficiently as the newer systems do, which is, I guess, accurate as far as it goes. But what buildings are we talking about? Are those projected to be updated? Uh, well, Baldwin is, uh, so, is the least efficient. I mean, okay. you know, and, it, and that's you know, remember, every one of our buildings, yeah. except the high school, was built before the first so called energy crisis, uh, or what we, what we say now is an energy crisis. And, in any event, so so efficient, yeah, yeah. Efficiency was not a, a exactly. big uh, a big cost driver. It wasn't something that it was viewed when you know when oil was twenty five cents a gallon. It wasn't viewed as, as economical to put a lot of money into making a, a heating system um, more efficient or putting insulation in the walls for that matter. The HVAC so, system at Baldwin is the next major capital improvement that we have on our calendar, and it will stretch across the next three summers. Electrical upgrades will be completed this summer with monies that have already been bonded, and this time next year we'll be coming forward with a two-year bond package talking about a two-year HVAC upgrade. Most likely. <laughs> Subject to everything else. Uh, we'll, we'll That's see. what's on our calendar currently. That's truly noted. That is what Dr. Freeman is uh, recommending. And, uh, okay. No, I mean, look, the HVAC at Baldwin is original HVAC. It's you know, and and we have done we have done some work in some of the other schools. And, and they are in much better shape. Uh, Baldwin is in the worst shape right now in terms of HVAC. Right. And the point is, uh, obviously, if, if utility prices rise again or oil increases again, we'll be stuck with this old system unless we address it at some point. Well, there's even another layer to Baldwin, and that is it's just not, not functioning the way that it, yeah. it, it, it needs to be replaced it, at it, some it, point. There's, there is a, Mr. Gurnham has presented a compelling case, uh, whether the board you know, ultimately, what the board does, I and mean, that's next year's issue. But it's an old system, and they're, 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 you're getting into the situation with that system. Uh, just the, the simple thing of getting parts. They don't make parts for 50-year-old HVAC systems or 45-year-old HVAC systems anymore so much. So, you know, we'll, we'll just have to deal. We'll have to address it. Because you know, this this goes back to a, uh, in our discussion we were having back at the time that the new high school was being uh, considered, and that is. If we're going to keep our old buildings, which I think the board is fine with, all six of the the uh, the the, uh, the other schools, I think we're fine with keeping those as schools as long as we need to. Um, but there are going to be some things that you have to do in order to not build any new schools. So it's it's it, there, there there are not three choices: do nothing, maintain and repair, and build new schools. Those are not the choices. The choices are maintain and repair and build new schools. We don't want to build new schools. We have absolutely no interest in building a new school, but we're going to have to do some work on some of the old schools. That's just the way it is when you have old buildings. Any other questions for the board? I have just a couple little ones. Um, when I see hockey transportation, this is for Linda, obviously, is that multiple trips or are these, is there some, I just want to know the consistency when I see different line items. I see 3,700 for December hockey transportation and then another one for December hockey transportation. It's multiple trips. Yeah, that's the East Haven and away games. Okay. And sensation station, refresh my memory what that is again, please. Special education service provider. Okay, so that's OT for December, I think was the line that I saw in there. Yeah, it's that contracted one. services outside of the school. Okay. And the asbestos management, is that, obviously, I assume it's an air quality monitor, monitoring thing that we have going on at all schools, the high school only? 
everything but the high school. You wouldn't everything be doing it at the high school. school. There's any yeah. asbestos in high school. Right. Right. So no, it's it's uh, pretty uh, major. Uh, no, from <laughs> residual is what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Almost any work in no, that would have been part of the trash fire. And any, any, and anything carrying down the old building would have been part of the part of the building. Right? That would have come out of our operation. And we don't. That's um, that's the right way to phrase it. So we monitor because we know there's asbestos there, obviously. But we are from a I think from our liability perspective, this covers us for any potential liability that we think knows, we might have. It requires requires testing that we do. I'm not sure if they think it's quarterly. We have to do routine testing in all the buildings except the high school. Okay. So it's a state or state event? Yes. Okay. And I think but a good state, you think. You would also see it anecdotally if there's work going on in areas where we know there's asbestos. So it's the regular maintenance program, but then it's also related to other construction. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. While you're looking at uh, on page 11 on the warrants, uh, Woodfield Sanitation, the uh, septic uh, uh, grease trap cleaning service. Why difference between the two schools, Cox and Baldwin? Uh, size of system? Oh, the same. much bigger school. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that, how often, is that, how often is that done? Let me tell us it needs to be done. So. <laughs> <laughs> you need to do it. Hopefully it starts to right? smell, right? Okay. It, it, is, we have, it has not come to the board's attention that there has been a problem, so I, I believe this is just regular. Yeah, I'm sure Mr. Gurner maintains the schedule. I think yeah. we'd have to ask him. I believe it's just off the top annual. of our head. It's an annual, it's I it's an annual, annual. annual bill. That's what I thought. Yeah, that yes. number looked pretty high. Yeah, I think it's just an annual thing. It's usually done right before school starts. Okay. It looks like they were cleaning up their invoices and got them out the door by the end of the, their first school year. Yeah, Quick question on Linda's report. I mean, it's a small item. I'm just sort of curious. You have under revenues a $250 donation from United Technologies, Calvin Leap. I mean, what triggers that? Why Calvin Leap? I believe it had something to do with a, a parent um, that requested it. And I don't know if they worked for through United Technologies. So it was a some Sometimes when parents volunteer, their employers will match with a contribution for volunteer hours. And I believe they're using those funds for library book purchases. Excellent. That's great. Okay, did you have others? Uh, the only other thing I checked off was the urethaning the high school floor. I know we had an expense in there before for the mats or something that went in on top of the floor that was in there before. Is this prior to the... Yes. Net? Okay. Yeah. Um, the original floor only had so many layers on it, and we preferred to put more layers on the finish on the floor. The mats are used to protect the floor when we're doing other events in there. Okay. Sure. Anything else? Any questions? Sure. No, thank you. Thank you. Two, two more quick ones. Um, the very first one on the, on the warrant. Um, there is a payment number two of five regarding the high school, snow removal. Is that a fixed amount, or is yes, that a varying amount? Flat amount, we know, last, and last one, we thought, boy, we need a bag. <laughs> 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 then in this one, <clears throat> maybe that's, that's a bad call. Yeah. So the okay. pendulum swings. <laughs> well, you know, it's like everything else here. There's a, if, if they set their price correctly, and we've got, and it's a, there's an even chance it's gonna be, a, we're gonna win, or they're gonna win. So they, we're satisfied with it. They haven't torn up any curds, I'll tell you that. So we're happy about that yeah. so far. But they've done a good job, we think. And, and so it is a flat uh, fee for you. Right. And, and I think you're correct. There's a risk on the part of both parties here because this was a brand new facility. Uh, we didn't know what stages would be completed, right. how much work was going to be required. So it, it took a leap of faith on both sides. Half of this lot is paved with new curbs in, half of this lot is still gravel. Um, we're learning where we can stage snow. Um, so yes, it was interesting. But it's been okay. Yeah, they've been, they've, been been very, they've been very responsive this year. You got Mr. Messini out every morning directing traffic, but <laughs> we're uh, not quite sure that we're paying up for that, but it seems to be working so far. It's, it, you, can greet the, you can greet the kids outside or inside. Both. Yeah. There, was one hey, last, quick, there was one last question on the uh, on the board of ed meeting minutes from January 11th. Um, Mr. Bloss requested an update on the ECS funding, and there was a note in here about a 
uh, cut of 113,000 from ECS. Yeah, they're, they're, is, they're, it, is that still the case? Or? I think it is, and I think it's the ECS as in the excess, it's the educational cost sharing. Right. That's the side that comes through the town's budget. Right. Um, I believe that that is uh, set through the, uh, the governor's uh, rescissions. Right. Uh, so uh, that's going to be obviously something the town and, and is going to have to think about, and we'll have to, I'm sure, dialogue about that a little bit. Um, there is a potential issue of concern in the next round of rescissions that the excess cost grant is subject to a statewide cut of $4 million. Now, $4 million statewide, and it, it's not you know, you know, a crazy alarming amount. On the other hand, it's an amount that's gonna, that may impact us if it, if it actually happens. Uh, we don't know if it is going to happen. I think, this, I think this has to be approved by the General Assembly, is my recollection. Um, and I've, made, I've talked to both uh, Representative Scanlon and Senator Kennedy about our concern about that, because it's obviously it's very late in the, in the budget year for us to be wondering where the state's going to come in on the excess cost grant. So, um, but that's, you know, we seem to have that argument every year too. You know, that's something yeah. that, that, that number has never been a static number uh, ever, right? Sometimes we budget it at a particular amount, and sometimes they come in higher, and sometimes they come in lower. So we'll, we'll just have to see. Well, those are dollars that we budget net, and so we, we are anticipating those as revenues, and if those are cut, it would generate a shortfall for us. Yeah. And I'm sure that they, they wouldn't be happy to hear up in America that we're the only governmental agency or government level of government that has to balance a budget every year. So and get it approved <laughs> by, by the taxpayers. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, an, that's an argument for another <coughs> day discussion. Sure. Anyone else? Any other questions? Uh, is there a motion to uh, accept the bill from the Board of Education for the month of January? So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Stay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know you won't be leaving since you have some interesting news to share with us in a little while. Uh, item 6, review and approve the report of expenditure for town government for January 2016. Sheila, what would you like to bring to our attention? Anybody want to wager whether she's going to start? I'll take revenue. I'll take revenue. I'll take revenue. You got to cover the best. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be expensive beers. <laughs> Good evening, Sheila. Good evening. So we can start with <laughs> um, I'm giving you a revised page, not because the current page that you have is really wrong, but it's not giving you a good reflection of the tax collections that were made in January. Um, and so I wanted to compare apples to apples when we're looking at last year and this year. And it has to do with the way that the, the, um, the January ended for the last day, because the last day to be current is actually the first um, business day of February. So. I did an adjustment for you to um, compare last year, and I also adjusted last year and this year. So we'll, we'll just start with tax collections. Um, tax collections now show that we've collected 97.4% of our budget versus 97.5 last year. That's, they're both adjusted, so we're comparing apples to apples, okay? So that brings our bottom line much better than it was on the, on the statement that you have in, in your packet. So at the end of January, we recognized 96.5% of our budget versus 94.6% last year. Um, all the big departments are, are doing um, well. They've all exceeded their budget. Um, the conveyance taxes are up in town clerk. They're at 68%. That's driving that increase. Ambulance revenue, we know that there's just more calls. Call volume is um, increased. I did, um, I did notice that billing for January seemed a little lower. Um, because if you straight line 50,000 out over the rest of the year, you might be a little short. I think that's, it's not really billing so much as it is collections. Um, okay. But that could easily be timing and we'll, you know, we'll get a better feel for that in February. Okay. But I, I do know that call volume continues to be, to be, high. to be higher than usual. Um, 
even with the family there at 62.5, not as, as uh, high as they were last year, but still higher than where they need to be because you could add another 112 onto that, so that would be like 70% at the end of January. Um, in terms of the state revenue, it, the state on the town side is down a little bit because they cut the um, pilots for st uh, state and colleges, uh, state-owned property and colleges and hospitals. But on the other hand, we're expected to get um, another um, um, grant for municipal projects that wasn't budgeted for about 60000 So that will compensate for that. Any questions on revenue? Uh, I'm assuming the adjustment on the uh, tax collector would normally fall to current taxes? It would fall to current, current taxes. taxes. It's about $4.7 million. So the $6 million that you see on, the, on your uh, detail is a little overstated. It's more like $2 million. Okay. It's a little early to start asking how we're going to wind up the end of the year. Hartman would ask. He would ask this one. He would ask this one. What do you know about? Anybody else on rivers? Any other questions? We have one on one with snows. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, let's move on to expenditures. Expenditures, we've obligated 63.9% of our budget, and that's compared to 65.8% last year. So we're in a better position um, at the end of January than we were last year. Um, that's before any of the storms, so there will be a little bit of overtime. Um, a little bit is a little bit of an understatement, but there will be um, some overtime um, next month from the past couple of weeks of uh, snow removal. Um, none of the departments really have anything unusual. They're all, you know, within where they should be at this point in the year. Uh, you have any I, do. I, have a, I have a question on fire. Uh, if we go to page seven, uh, their full-time salaries, they seem to be running right at about target of 57% versus 58% uh, percent, uh, through the budget year. Um, I thought we had some vacancies. Do we still pay, and I think it's with workers' comp cases, do we still pay <coughs> full-time salaries while they are out? Yes. Um, we do, and as the workers' comp checks come in, we net it against um, the workers' comp line. Um, there is probably a lag time That's with the that, that was my next checks. question, because workers' comp doesn't seem to make up for a full-time salary at this point, at 17000 at $17, or 3500 uh, a month. We probably will see a little bit of a shortage in the um, personnel, personnel accounts for the fire department at the end of the year. We, we sort of know that now, and I, I think that um, that was uh, analyzed during the budget process when we put together the salaries. Other questions? Anybody else? Um, This is related to both a, bond, a, uh, a warrant, and I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but uh, I saw a warrant on page five um, under communications uh, for uh, network support for fire department. Yeah, I was confused as to how network support for fire department falls under communications. And then, you know, I saw I think a pretty significant uh, expenditure under communications for maintenance service and contracts, which is exactly what Mr. Leatherman was paid for. Well, I think that the, um, the, the, the two vendors are very different. One is sort of a service contract on the equipment, and um, the other is actually um, the uh, network support um, person who, who manages their network. I was, I was just more confused by the fact that it's under communication, but it says for a fire department. Is that that's Usually. where it's no. That's where it's been budgeted. Okay. Anybody else? Are we in the warrants now, or are we? I have some more questions too. Yeah. Go ahead, Ken. Uh, 
The first one is the land use application fee for DEP. What is that for? Uh, very little. Okay, yeah, just page right. Number. It's on the it's on the front page, of the general the weekly check. I think it was two. Or, I think it was two. Two lines. I can find it later in here. Page 17, 2700. Can you mention the vendor again, please? Department of Environment, Energy and Environmental Services. D. D. So we got a base of These are um, revenues that we've collected um, and put into a balance sheet, and then we're actually remitting um, a portion of uh, an, an application fee to the state. It's not actually our, our expense. It would be uh, funds that we collected through a permit and then we set aside a portion that belongs to DEP, a balance sheet account, and then transmitted to the state uh, pursuant to their requirements. You could see under, on that. So what we, co we collect money that is due to DEP? It, for it, land use? For certain applications, a percentage of the application, or a percentage of the permit would be due to the state. And when that happens, we, we split the, the deposit into revenue, a portion is revenue, and a portion goes into an account, a liability account that we then pay the state from. Else. What are what are the um, fifteen? There are three line items general to uh, the state of Connecticut. They're they're probably for three different land use applications. It could even be for the same land use app application because it's three different. Well, it's two. It's two different departments in the state. I could let you know exactly what the application is for. So you think it's related to that other deep one? I. I can't tell you for sure, but what I can tell you is that none of these checks are, are town expenditures. Or none of them are part of the town budget. They've all been paid for by the applicant. Is this a normal mm -hmm. amount that we see on here, or is this unusual? No, it, it's probably one application that's, un, you know, we, we don't see this all the time. But there, I'm sure there is one application, one or two, that this is related to. Yeah, a couple uh, on the, uh, the special fund checks. There's some engineering expenses for renovation of Cox Fields. I'll throw this out to the floor here. Um, I think this this has been mentioned somewhere. It's probably in the in the capital plan as well. But just remind me when that is going to happen and what's happening at Cox Fields. Cox, uh, Cox Fields are going to be redone uh, over this summer. Uh, it's already, I believe it's, um, actually it's going to be, you might have to help me out Linda, on this one. I know this is the design fees. I want to be right. I want to be right there. And they presented to the building committee, not obviously this past month, but the month before. Uh, and I think it's supposed to be work done this summer. And redone means? Regrade, re re completely regrade. Drainage. <coughs> yeah. Um, just the fields. Just the fields on the upper. Upper Cox Fields. Okay. The lower Cox Fields are not being touched. It's the Upper Cox Fields. Okay. Just that that area. Okay. Um, and another one is for the town. Same same report. There, there's a fifteen thousand dollar charge for it. It says sidewalk replacement. I'm just curious where that was. Fifteen thousand dollars for sidewalk. It may, is it, is it actually a check that was cut, I'm sorry, or was it the transfer of funds from general mm -hmm. fund into the special fund? Not sure. No, no, it's under special fund weekly checks, so. so. that most likely is an expense, and I don't know the sidewalk. I'll, I'll, let, you, I'll let you know. Okay. And, okay. Yeah, it's interesting, I have you know, along the same line. There's one, that one's for blue ribbon services, and A&W looks like they, I assume A&W did the one on the green, it's a sidewalk, sidewalk connection. One's a sidewalk replace, one's a sidewalk connection, but it didn't 
I had a question. Yeah, we're doing you. various side ones. I couldn't tell you which ones they are. I, I, I guess maybe the, the bigger question is, is there a schedule um, that, that's, that's available? I mean, has somebody sort of projected out what, what's going to be needed over the next four or five years? And is, that, is that available? Yes. Okay, I mean, I'd like to see that. I'd be yeah. curious just to see what that schedule is. Engineering, yeah. And occasionally uh, we would come across sidewalks that have to be repaired. Suddenly, yeah. yeah. I mean, I just, those are not in the schedule. Okay. Okay. So we, we, but we used to use just one contractor for sidewalks. We don't do that anymore then. That's correct. Right. Okay. And these are checks coming out of the special fund, or sidewalk. Sidewalk fund, yeah. Can I go back to the, the question about the state? Sure. Two of the, one of the three line items that you were referring to, we see every month. That's the educational part of the building permit fees. Again, it's, it's, a, it's a portion of every building permit fee that comes in that we have to remit to the state, not paid by, by the town. So that one is normal every month. Oh, no, no, that, right. That is, <laughs> got me confused, medical <laughs> it's, a, it's the, it's, it's the union, it's the Teamster Union, that's the medical payment for um, the oh, okay. public works employees that we remit every month to the union. Okay. There's, there's one check that uh, goes out to uh, Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield, but it's for, um, is that the town? Carroll Stream, Illinois? Um, page 17. Is that, is that the town that it's being sent to? It says retirees medical health there. What, what that is, is um, a premium based insurance plan that we have for our reti certain retirees that um, they're on the plan and many of them pay for it. Most of them pay for it actually. And we just send the premium every month to Anthem and Carol Street. Oh, really? Okay. But it has nothing to do with the town fully. Uh, fully um, yeah, I was going to say, because obviously I would think if someone's retired, they could go to a park plan or you know, to us for reimbursement as opposed to another Blue Cross that's based in uh, Illinois. Well, it's, 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 we arrange it through Anthem. It's just that it's a different, it's a, it's a premium based um, product. So it's just, that's, that's where the drop of the uh, lock box is. Okay. Anything else from the council? Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, move to the rest of them here. Building permits, golf course. Uh, building permits still look like it's going to be the case. Yeah, close enough. Yeah, we'll get there. We should, get, should exceed last year. Mm -hmm. um, Do we have a stats on the, on the RFP for the RFP golf, for golf, golf course? Two uh, bids were submitted and reviewed. Uh, golf Course Commission interviewed two bidders. Uh, golf Course Commission met with the Board of Selectmen this afternoon in executive session to uh, work out a possible contract, and that's about as much as I'm going to tell you. <laughs> We're going into executive session. <laughs> that's fine. Thank you, Joe. We may or may not accept bids. Okay. We have that prerogative. Uh, medical benefits, uh, a little better month uh, this month. Uh, I had occasion to talk to Sheila uh, earlier today. Um, under the catastrophic claim stuff, we're now up over uh, $2 million in claims exceeding 75000 And the uh, amount covered by ISL is now 563594 So. Uh, looks like we're going to get pretty close to that ISL premium and more likely to exceed it. So, which is not good news for our employees, but um, anyway. But we're still projecting a surplus uh, for this year of uh, $468,000, uh, which is, leaves us in a very strong position. 
uh, with a beginning fund balance of 673, so we're over one, projecting over $1.1 million uh, surplus in that account. So we're in good shape. Any further? Is there a motion to accept the bills from the town for the month of January? Is there a motion? I'll make that motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Recusals? Thank you. Showtime. Item 7, receive proposed Board of Education budget for fiscal year 2016-2017. Easier for guys to move over. Can you see this one? Yeah, I can see it. I can see it. You can see around the corner. Huh? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. We are. I'm going to. I'm going to actually depart a little bit from what I'm usually. What my introduction is usually at this budget presentation. I'm going to admit one thing right now. This is not the most exciting budget that we have ever presented to you, in that we do not have any new programs that we're proposing. We do not have any new initiatives that are that we're asking for additional money for. We're not asking to add uh, fully kindergarten. We're not asking to add. Uh, foreign language instruction in the elementary schools. We're not. Uh, we're not asking for any of those things. This is really much more. We we much more of a maintenance budget. But I don't mean that in any sort of a negative way. I think I mean it in really the most positive way that I possibly can. We are in a good place in this town right now with our public education system. We like where what we uh, what some of the initiatives Dr. Freeman and the rest of the administrative team and the faculty have uh, been implementing. Uh, we uh, believe that this is probably a good year to try to, uh, to try to consolidate, to try to make sure that our implementation is going in the right direction, and trying to make sure that, uh, that really the initiatives that we've undertaken are actually being implemented uh, in the best way possible and the most efficient way possible. We have looked at some, some very interesting issues. I'm sure if you read the newspaper, you know that we have been looking at the whole issue of high school start times. Uh, there is nothing in this budget relating to high school start times. We think, though, that we may be able to, because of some of the things we've learned during the exercise, we may be ultimately able to try to make some changes in the bus transportation issue that may lead to some efficiencies. Uh, we learned some things about what we were doing uh, as part of this uh, real examination that, we're, that we think we can, we can make some changes in. And we're going to make some, we, uh, we, we did, we did uh, agree to make some staffing uh, changes as well. But this is, as I say, I, I'd like to, I don't, I don't, I don't want to understate it because I think any budget is a reflection of what our community values are. And I think this budget reflects uh, how important uh, our town uh, sees public education and, what, and, the, and the educational system, the achievement that our students have, have uh, uh, been able to sustain and the work that our faculty has been doing. Uh, but this is, this is uh, and I should add, obviously, this is one of the lowest uh, increases that we've brought to this board. And we're just under 2%. Which is, I believe, the lowest since the since 2000. I want to say eight, but it, it was one eight around that time. Right. Um, so I will uh, I will turn it over to Dr. Freeman first of all to give, just give you some highlights about what it is in this proposal. I should say that the Board of Education looked at this very very carefully. I think Dr. Freeman may think that we looked at it too carefully. We actually reduced it from his proposal by almost a half a million dollars. Uh, and ultimately, though, the vote um, was unanimous uh, to uh, move this uh, proposed budget forward. And I do want to just note that this, was, this budget was developed in very close collaboration, not only with the Board of Finance and the, and the Education Committee of the Board of Finance, but also with the First Lifeman's Office and the Board of Staff. Uh, this is, the, the, this is a, a situation where everybody was really working together to really uh, to, uh, try to present as responsible a budget as possible, and I think we took some of your comments into account in, uh, in presenting these, uh, this proposal, so I'll turn it over to Dr. Freeman. Thank you very much, Mr. Boss. Thank you all of you for the time this evening. Um, I, I'll simply say in opening that I agree with Mr. Boss, this budget to me feels um, like the budget being presented from a school district that is hitting its stride. Um, you know that we've invested in some significant work over the last several years. While there's nothing wholly new on the plate this year, we continue to work on those previous investments and truly are hitting our stride. It is a school district 
and you'll see as we go through the presentation um, where things are very much falling into place. Um, I want to quickly go through the opening three or four slides, not spend time on them, but just remind you that the budget is built on an existing mission and vision statement. The budget is built upon this year's priorities and uh, initiatives, the priorities as set by the Board of Education and the specific initiatives at the school and classroom level that fall under those priorities. It is built on certain budget assumptions um, that build first on health and safety, second on a focus on instruction, and finally on the idea that we expect to be creative and resourceful with our resources before asking for more resources. And ultimately it is built on enrollment. Um, our enrollment projection for this coming school year suggests that we should be approximately 80 students smaller than we are currently. Um, we do know that we've been looking at declining enrollments over the last few years. I will note, however, that last year we projected this time last year to be 100 students smaller, and we actually came back only 11 students fewer this current year than we were over the last fiscal year. Um, we do have um, a, a very well thought out, a very complete demographic study that was completed last year that's available on our website. Um, we have a lot of faith in the demographer that put that work together, but when we received it, we received it with the notice that there are two variables that couldn't be accounted for, the inclusion of full day kindergarten and the opening of our new high school. So whether last, year, whether last year's miss was a blip or whether it's the beginning of a trend, we're going to look very carefully and watch these enrollment figures. I do want to note that the budget we present in front of you is built on a reduction of 80 students. We're just being cautious about that. As you know, this year we projected to reduce four kindergarten classrooms and we have had to return two of those classrooms and they're currently being staffed with positions that were unbudgeted in this current budget. So we'll watch that unfold very carefully. And let me just emphasize on that point. It, it, it just so, I, I know the board knows this, but just to remind you, that's the second year of the demographic study. The, the, this, the, so it is already off by almost 100 kids uh, in the second year, so something changed, at least for that year, something changed. Now, what, is that a trend? Is that something? We're going to have to look at that. And if, and if, the, the, if these numbers uh, don't, uh, for 16, 17, don't uh, uh, come to pass, then it may be that we need to go out and look at the demographic study again. Because it was, the first 10-year study that we had was almost yeah, a person. I mean, it was the most remarkable thing uh, I've seen, but and in the second year of the new one, it was off in a major way in, in, the, in, in terms of increased enrollment. So we'll, we'll just have to keep an eye on it. All that being said, the budget that we present to you at this time is a total fiscal year budget of $58,656,791. That is a year-over-year -year increase of $1,147,274, or a 1.99% increase. Looking at that in a five-year history, uh, as Mr. Gloss noted, you'll see that our budgets, the increase in our budgets, has been trending lower over the last five years. Each year, the requested increase has been smaller than the requested increase the year before. Um, to take you through some of what underlies that number, the work that brought us to where we are, um, first, again, uh, working on our budget assumptions, working with the resources at hand, um, we have generated efficiencies around salaries. Uh, we negotiated a, a fair, and reasonable, and favorable contract a few years ago, and this budget is built upon reduced teaching and para positions that reflect the declining enrollment. Um, we'll talk a little bit about special education, but we continue to focus on special education, um, looking at uh, managing the costs associated with special ed, although it is one of the biggest variables and hardest to anticipate cost centers. Um, as was mentioned earlier tonight, there are reductions in our supply and material lines, both as a result of declining enrollment, but also as a result of the heating conversation that we had. Heat is carried under our supplies, and so that has impacted that area. Um, and as Mr. Bloss mentioned, while there are areas that we would like to continue to work on, and while there are places that we would like to continue to grow out our school district, for the time being, we have deferred those future, those other investments, and we'll show you some of what we discussed that we didn't build into this budget as we move forward. Um, and just to illustrate one of these areas, um, special education spending over the last several years has been an area that we have worked on. Um, 
worked on deeply. Um, I first want to say that we believe we've improved our special ed services over the last several years. That was our goal. Starting there, I then want to draw your attention to the funding behind special education. The blue line on this chart shows our, our budgeted special education expenditures. And you will see that we have been challenged over the last several years to respond to the changing realities of special education. We've had years where, where we have been dramatically underfunded. We've had years where we were over. The big drop is the year that the most significant restructuring took place. And we were overly optimistic in the savings that would be related to that restructuring when you see the blue line taking a significant dip. But if you look at the red line, which is our actual spending over the last several years, what you will see is that we have begun to bring a sense of control and predictability to our special education spending. Since school year 12-13, special education's funding, real, real actual expense, has leveled. Um, you'll see that this year uh, our projected expense is slightly above what we budgeted. That number, in fact, is going to grow a little bit. When we finish the school year, we know that the delta between the red and the blue dots will be a little bit more than we show here. It's changed just in the last two weeks. But we know that special education is one of those variable areas. Our goal over time is to be able to show you a chart in the next four or five years where special education spending continues to be level and where we're able to bring the blue and the red lines completely together. Um, just as a point of illustration, had we not made these changes, had we continued on the course that we were setting in school years 10, 11, 11, 12, 12, 13, we know that this is hypothetical, but if the, if the increases continued unchanged, you're looking at a $2 million gap that is, that is illustrated there. Now, those are costs avoided. We believe that we have changed the trajectory of special education spending, um, but we feel very good about the work that we've done. And again, I want to go back and say, we've done this while improving the product. We have parents who are either not coming out to complain during budget season about the special ed services, or in fact, are coming out to thank the Board of Education during budget season for the special ed services that we provide. Um, just looked at in another way, um, if you can go back one, yep, yeah, thank you. If you look at special education expenses as a percentage of the overall budget, you'll see that again in school year 12-13, they peaked at 8.2% of the overall budget. And since school year 12-13, the percentage of special education expenditure as a percent of the overall budget has trended down from 82 to 7.8, 7.4, 6.8, and now 6.7 projected in this budget that we present to you here. I do want to note, these expenses are in the areas of tuition, contracted services, and transportation. Um, staffing has been pulled out of here because our staff members cannot be identified as either regular ed or special ed. Um, too many of our staff members straddle um, those two worlds and service all of our students. Um, but when we talk about efficiencies and when we talk about doing better work, um, this is what we're talking about. It's work like the work we've done in special ed. Every year we talk about the cost drivers. Uh, the significant cost drivers in this budget are only two. Last year this slide had five or six entries on it when we presented it to you. Um, this year there's only two things that are driving our budget. Salaries are increasing $700,000. Medical insurance is increasing approximately $300,000. These two cost centers alone represent a million dollar increase in our budget, and I'll remind you our total increase in this budget is only 1.1 million. So obviously the increase is falling into these two areas. Uh, to talk a little bit further about salaries, salaries are not increasing because we're extending our staffing. In this budget, we are projecting a decrease in teacher staffing of 6.6 .6 FTEs, you'll see that significantly those fall at the elementary level. Fewer students projected to come in, we'll be looking at fewer staff classrooms at the elementary level. We're looking at having a reduction of five paraprofessional positions. Some of this is from scheduling more efficiently in special education. Some of it is looking for other efficiencies. A para position that used to be required in the library at Guilford High School is no longer required because the space is more open, more, easy, more easy, easily supervised, and we were able to generate efficiency from good design at that level. The only staffing increase that is uh, included in this budget is the increase of one custodial position, um, and that is being assigned to the new high school. We've got increased square footage, and we will be picking up custodial responsibilities 
for 595 New England Road. We used to refer to it as the Science Wing, um, but we'll be responsible in partnership with the town for maintaining those spaces. So we are asking for one increase of a custodial position. To look at staffing in another light, um, a history of staffing compared to enrollment over the last several years. What I do want to note here is that while enrollment has been decreasing since school year 9-10, we may only show that we're five, and this is certified staff only. I didn't do district-wide staffing. I pulled out certified staff. We're talking about teachers, support staff, and administrative staff in, in this comparison. While we may only be five fewer certified staffing positions, I do want to draw your attention to the work that's been going on across the same time period. At the same time, while we have been looking at declining enrollment, we have been looking at reinvesting those resources, again, back to our budget assumptions, that we will use our resources thoughtfully. So over this time, you know that we've come to you repeatedly to talk about the instructional coaches building an embedded professional development cohort in the school system so that we're not sending our people out to listen to workshops, to attend a workshop somewhere else, and then try to bring that work and translate it back. We've built literacy um, instructional coaches. We have a math instructional coach on site now. We've got a math curriculum specialist on site. We've grown that professional development, that coaching cadre, to eight positions, eight FTEs over this time period. Our special education programming has expanded, including seven FTEs that have grown out as we've built capacity in the district. Programs like an alternative high school at the high school level, um, a therapeutic day setting at the high school level, um, a program at the elementary level that supports our students who have autism or autism-like needs, um, a neurodevelopmental program at the elementary level, a therapeutic program at the elementary and middle level. So we've increased our special education staffing, including putting special education teachers in regular education classrooms in a co-teaching model. Again, seven positions that we've grown out over this time period, and the one-year increase of full-day kindergarten, where we needed to double our kindergarten staffing. We went from offering a half-day program to a full-day program, requiring the increase of six FTEs in that year. If I, if I could just make one observation about this slide, the, <coughs> this is related in a very direct and very tangible way to the slide a couple of slides ago where Dr. Greenland was talking about uh, controlling uh, outplacements. And, and we, we call it tuition, but Correct. it's just simply the, the fees that outside providers charge for kids that are placed in, a, in, a, in a, some alternative setting, not in the Gilbert Public Schools. The, the cost uh, savings on the tuition line would have been flat impossible, and uh, impossible to achieve without that special ed program seven FTE expansion that's, that's reflected in this slide. They are directly related. And I'd go further. I'd suggest that the same could be said about the instructional coaching component. To have, to have instructional experts who work with the teachers in the building make those teachers better able to meet the needs of every student in their classroom. Special education students as they mainstream to our, our highest achieving students. Um, the instructional coaching has gone a long way to make all of our teachers more effective and therefore help us to maintain more students in district. Can I, can I jump in? Sure. Question here? And then I'll ask this again at the budget meetings, but with regard to the coaches, um, how does how does it essentially they stay fresh with their work. I mean, you know, I can envision a situation where you have a certain number of coaches teaching a certain number of teachers sure. over a four, five, six year period, and, and all of a sudden you start to, the return you start to get can level off. I mean, what's the process by which their work continues to be challenged? So, uh, one, I really appreciate the question. The short answer is Dr. Rankine. Um, the short answer is that these folks work very closely with Dr. Keene, and in fact, they spend half of every Friday working as a professional learning community out of their buildings in Lathrop House with Dr. Keene. So they're constantly reviewing research, they're constantly looking at their practice, and she's constantly supervising, evaluating, and helping them to become stronger. We continue our relationship with IFL, the Institute for Learning out of the University of Pittsburgh, and so we contract with fellows from the University of Pittsburgh. So while these folks are on the ground working every single day with our teachers, fellows from IFL, over the last several years, that's been a fellow who has worked with literacy, contracts into the district for six or eight or 10 days a year, and 
coaches are coaches. This year we've shifted that fellow money over into the area of mathematics. And our math fellow, who I like to point out, his name is Steve Miller. Steve comes and spends 12 days in district this year working directly with our math coaches and the last two years working directly with our principals so that all of our principals are better instructional leaders specifically in the area of mathematics. And in May, we'll be working with our Board of Education to share with the board what we're doing at the classroom level to change that work. Um, to some degree, uh, we've had the ability to keep expanding and growing. So we've had, uh, at this point, two of our classroom teachers who worked with coaches who have now developed and moved into the position of coach. Many of our coaches are looking to move on. They're looking to either become administrators or become um, assistant superintendents for curriculum instruction like Dr. Keene. So it becomes um, a really rich area where we're growing their expertise. They're feeding that to the staff every, every day, literally. And it becomes a, a, a leadership growth opportunity for some of them as well. Um, we have some very talented coaches um, who are in short time going to be either very successful principals or they're going to be they're going to be directors of curriculum or assistant superintendents for curriculum um, based on the work that they've done. Well, I got this on that question. <laughs> I appreciate it. It's a really good question. <laughs> um, I, Lou, I'll actually go so far as to say that we have. In, in many, many school districts, what happens with coaching is you pick a really talented fourth grade teacher, somebody who's really good with 10-year-olds, and you pull them out of the classroom and you say, go, go coach now. And, and working with, with adult instructors is really different than working with hungry students. Um, it's a different skill set. So we hire really carefully looking for people who have adult learning experience. They've got professional development experience. And then we work with a really structured model. Um, we don't just say, that you're free all day long, go ahead and find the people who need to be coached. Um, I, I think we structure it to a way, and through that relationship with IFL, we've been really very successful. And in fact, other districts have, have come to see how we structure the coaching model. Um, a place like New Haven or Hartford, where you've got 50 of these people, um, I don't think that they're getting the impact that we've been getting from ours. And we've grown it really slowly. In 10-11, we only worked with three instructional coaches. We moved it from three to four. We went from four to six. And in the last year where we added a math curriculum specialist and only one math coach, it's taken us this long to increase from three to eight of these positions because we've done it really slowly and thoughtfully. It took us two years to fill the math coach position after we created it. Um, one last point I want to make around staffing. Um, I, I fully expect, and the board was, was immediately responsive to the fact that we're reducing, um, we're reducing teaching positions, we're reducing para positions, and yet the salary line looks more static than it has looked in past years. And that is a compounding effect of a change in retirements. For the last four years, we were retiring um, in significant numbers. This year, we're only retiring a quarter of the number of teachers who retired the year before. Um, and so each of those years where you've seen 12, 16, 17 retirements, we've had this leveling effect on the salary line where we were able to replace those positions at a much lower salary point than the, the retirees who went out. It helped to pad um, some of the contractual salary increases and it helped to offset some of the staffing adjustments that we made. And this year we had just much less of that adjustment to be able to respond to. The other piece is the compounding piece. We've had 57 retirements over the last five years, so you know that when a teacher makes it to the top of the salary scale, they may be our most expensive employee, but they're fairly static. Those people see very small raises year to year. The younger employees help to lower that line for one year, but then for the next, depending on where we hire them, for the next 15 years, they impact the salary rate more greater year to year as they move up the steps. So we've got a younger teaching group, and they're impacting that salary increase more significantly year to year as they increase their steps. Again, just to reiterate what we've said a couple times, um, this is a year to focus on the work that's already begun. There is no new initiative. We're not explaining to you full day kindergarten or, or new special education models. It's continuing the work that we have done moving up to this point. And just to point out, um, 
I said earlier when we met, and I've said to the Board of Ed, that I felt like I brought this budget to them more unfinished than budgets that I have bought to them in previous years. The Board of Education did more work and had a greater impact on our administrative budget this year than in any year since I've been here. There were deep and thoughtful conversations and big questions that were left open as we brought this budget to the Board of Education. So this budget doesn't include growing our math coaching positions, which is something that we're committed to doing, but we know that we can go slowly and thoughtfully. Um, last year, we invited Dr. Jim Borland from the um, Teachers College at Columbia University to look at our work, and one of his strongest recommendations was to replicate the coaching model that we built around um, literacy in the mathematics area. We currently have math coaching at the middle grades, but not at the elementary grades. We had a long conversation about growing that out into the elementaries this year, and that's an investment that we're not making this year. But it'll be a conversation that we continue. Mr. Bloss mentioned that we had more than a year's worth of conversation around changing high school start times and the impact that that could have, uh, the positive impact that it could have for our students, but the significant financial impact. There is nothing in this budget. We're not moving forward with that work this year, but it will be a conversation that continues. We had parents come out this year and lobby for increased art and music time at the elementary schools, uh, another good for our students, but we have not built that into a budget request this year. Um, and site improvements, which this board has encouraged us to work on. We have grown the site improvement line each year over the last five years, and this year we bring it to you flat funded. Now it's in a much better place than it was before. We built it from approximately $200,000 to over $500,000 annually, but it's the first year since I've been here that there's no investment in growing that this year. Um, and significantly, um, the board does not expect to have a capital bonding request to go forward with this operational budget this year. Um, again, we've tried to plan, we've tried to be thoughtful. It doesn't mean we're not working at the, on the buildings this summer, but we are ready to, to do the work this summer. The funding is in place, and we don't need to make a capital request this year, a bonding request to continue that work this year. Those are the nuts and bolts behind the budget. I know that Mr. Gloss wants to talk with you a little bit about what you get for this budget. Yeah, a, a fair assessment of where what, where we are or where we're heading really requires us to, to um, understand where we are as a district, both in terms of student achievement, but also in terms of cost. Uh, fundamentally, the Board of Education looks at you know, most of these questions as a cost-benefit analysis. I think that you've encouraged us to do that. Uh, it's very easy to see what cost is, and it's not so easy all the time to see uh, what benefit is. So we're going to kind of touch on both of those things here tonight. Where are we in Guilford right now in terms of per capita income? We're 25th in the state of Connecticut right now. Interestingly, in the past 15 years, we've moved up that list. Uh, I don't know what that means. I'll leave that up to somebody uh, more interested in demographics. Uh, uh, and obviously, we have to we, we, we have to provide services and represent everybody, whether they're above that or below that number. But right now, we're in a very we're in a, a, a very interesting place in terms of our per capita income. Uh, 15 years ago, we were 30th in the state. Now we're 25th. Uh, there's some other economic indicators that I think may be of interest to you. Our median household uh, income is 35th in the state, almost $100,000 a year. Uh, just as a point of comparison, some of the other neighboring towns around us, I wouldn't have expected some of those things necessarily, but, but those are nonetheless where, where we are. And in terms of unemployment, Guilford right now has uh, one of the very lowest unemployment rates in the entire state of Connecticut at uh, 154 out of 169 towns. Maybe that doesn't surprise us, but in any event. Now, what it was about, about our debt per capita? Uh, average Connecticut uh, debt per capita for all towns is 20, a little over $2,300. Right now, we're, we're 84th in the state, significantly below the average. Uh, in 2007, we were 108th in the state, uh, and uh, uh, also uh, significantly below average. So uh, we have been, uh, we have carried historically relatively low debt, much lower than the state average for a period of years. And if you see some of the comparable towns uh, uh, and, and what their situation is, they are in a very different uh, a very different spot. What about debt as a percentage of grand list and a, a net a, a equalized grand list? 0.8% as of the end of 2000, uh, fiscal year ending 2014. And net equalized grand list is really just a number that OPM puts together to, 
to try to anticipate what the actual brand list or the actual market value of properties is, is, is in a town because all towns, uh, they calculate the brand list at different times. And so if you're going to try to fairly compare one town to another, you have to try to equalize the brand list. That's what OPM does. And so you see that our, our, uh, our uh, debt at, as a percentage of our net equalized brand list at the end of 2014 was less than half of the, uh, of the average. What about our tax levy per capita? I think this is a very interesting slide. We're 39th in the state right now in our tax levy per capita. Now, you may notice that there are some other really nice towns in New Haven County that are in a little bit of a different situation uh, in terms of uh, tax levy per capita. And yet, not surprisingly, you see some of the uh, Fairfield County uh, towns uh, very, uh, very high on that list, but then also some New Haven County uh, towns close by as well. Now, this has nothing to do with the Board of Education, but I think that Mr. Moss is too, uh, too uh, modest to uh, note this, but Guilford is very efficient at collecting taxes. What that means is people, we, we are very good at making sure that people pay their fair share and that, and that people who pay their taxes are not supporting a bunch of people who don't pay their taxes. So we're one of the very highest in the state of Connecticut on that issue. What about our equalized mill rate? 126th in the state. Far below, significantly below the state average below some other uh, towns that we think of as, as very, uh, very successful towns, very uh, high achieving towns. Now, in our per student expenditures, 70 in the state, just about average, a couple of, couple of hundred dollars, or not even a couple of hundred dollars uh, above the state average. But the point is, what do we get for that? One thing we get is that our students' performance is anything but average. And that's not just Dr. Freeman who says that, or me. It is, uh, it is outside groups. The Connecticut Coalition for Achievement Now says we are in the top 10 uh, high schools in the state of Connecticut. Uh, now, some of, them, and some of those are magnet schools, or at least one of those is a magnet school. But those are some pretty good schools that were, that were uh, given an A grade as well as, as Guilford. U.S. News and World Report says we're the 17th uh, highest ranked high school in the state, 14th among traditional high schools or three magnet schools, and number one in New Haven County. That's, that's an achievement. Now, what about, what about the SBAC scores? You, you may remember there was a bunch of, uh, of publicity last summer that said scores are plunging as students take the new tougher SBAC test. And they are tougher. They, the, the standards, uh, the achievement standards have changed in a very significant way. But we welcome that, frankly, because we think that, that we're trying to make sure that, that uh, our students are learning in this, and assuming this is going to be a fair assessment, it's OK to set the bar higher because that, we have that expectation. And on an average statewide, the achievement levels were down 50% uh, or almost 50% uh, in literacy. Well, what about in Guilford? This is across all grades for 2014-2015. We had almost 80% meet or exceed the target achievement level in English language arts and literacy. Now, 12th in the state of Connecticut. I think this is an interesting slide to follow up on what Dr. Freeman was just talking about with the literacy coaches and what the effect of the literacy coaches has been in part, as well as what we need to do at the mathematics in the mathematics uh, area. I think we can make that number for English uh, for math equivalent to the number for English language arts if we do the professional development that we have made the commitment to do in literacy. Um, we did identify actually one other one other. Um, in area that we, that we think we've been able to, to uh, address now, and that was uh, math achievement at Baldwin Middle School. Uh, it turns out that we have, uh, uh, we're, we're under teaching math in, at Baldwin, uh, and now have added instructional time to make sure that all of the areas that are part of the state curriculum for fifth and sixth grade are actually taught in a, in a deep way. Uh, we just didn't have instructional time in mathematics, and so we think that we've solved that question. Now, how does Guilford compare in terms of budgets and, and achievement? Uh, nine districts in the state scored higher on both math and English language arts on SBAC on all grades. Uh, seven of those nine spend more per student than does the town of Guilford. And there are some really great districts that have, uh, have fewer students meeting achievement levels in at least one subject, so including Greenwich, Weston, and West Hartford. So, we have worked cooperatively with the Board of Finance. Uh, we've worked cooperatively with the First Selectman to propose a responsible budget. There are no new initiatives. We think this is a time to just really make sure that we're doing what we're doing uh, correctly. 
And we do want to maintain and respect the trust that we think the, the, this Board of Finance has placed in us, as well as parents and taxpayers. Uh, we think that if we take into account student achievement and really what the product has been over the past several years, uh, that this is a responsible, um, a responsible place to be. We just, again, when it comes down to return on investment, um, we're incredibly proud about the results that we get um, in any measure. Uh, we talked quite a bit about, about standardized testing, but if you look at our athletic programs, if you look at our musical and arts programs, if you look at our fine arts programs, um, the, the number of recognitions and awards that we win in robotics and physics, our students are getting out and competing and doing well by any measure. We're an exemplary school district. Uh, we continue to focus on instruction while mo monitoring the changes in mandates at the state level. And we're willing to bring in outside experts, teachers college, teachers special education. We have groups come in and help us focus on what we do. We just believe that we continue to be an unparalleled educational value and appreciate all of your support in the work that we do. Potentially different budget than the last time we saw it. Uh, and I want the federal administration and the board to have one Presentation and, and uh, you know I deal with a lot of my colleagues 
particularly through COG, Council of Governments, and uh, make my job pretty easy because they, <laughs> they always compliment the Guilford School System. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I, I just want to start off by saying that uh, this budget uh, does not have any new employees added, and no additional hours, so we're going along as, just as we are right now. And uh, I'd say it's my pleasure to present to the Board of Finance the Board of Selectmen's budget for the 2017 uh, fiscal year. I believe this budget successfully balances our objectives to maintain the property tax stability while providing the necessary resources to provide essential town services while protecting the health and safety of our citizens and maintain our capital assets and infrastructure and to improve our quality of life. The Board of Selectmen is committed to continuing to provide the citizens of Guilford with the highest quality of services which they require and expect. Our initiatives include, one, increasing the capital spending within the operating budget, a multi-year strategy to reduce our future debt burden. Two, funding our pension plan uh, at liability at the levels recommended by our actuaries, continuing the commitment made in prior years to increase the funding to improve road infrastructure and maintain both our coastal and inland roads. This budget does not include any new positions and was constructed without the reliance of fund balance. In addition to providing essential safety and public protection and maintaining excellent quality of life, this budget also supports economic development, maintains the elderly tax relief program, and addresses the problems of lease control at Lake Quantum. The Board of Selectmen budget is being presented to you in two parts, for a total of $35,829,000. Part one is the operating budget, including the capital budget. Part two is the debt service budget for both town and school projects, including the new Gilbert High School. The operating budget for the town is $28,373,000 which is an increase of $692,000 over the 2016 budget, or a 2.5% increase. The debt service portion of this budget is $7,456,000, which is an increase of $1,942,000, or a 35% increase from the current budget. The operating budget is detailed as follows. The submitted budgets to the Board of Selectmen, which totaled $20,482,000, which the Board of Selectmen then reduced by $167,000. These reductions consisted of $12,000 from information systems, $10,000 from insurance, $8,000 from legal, and $50,000 from engineering and public works, $17,000 from park and recreations, and 70,000 from employee benefits. The capital budget was presented at $1,358,000. After capital consideration and consultation with department heads, the Board of Selectmen was able to reduce the capital budget to $1,161,000, an increase of $141,000, or a 13.81% increase. The employee benefits portion of the budget was submitted at $6,954,000. Reductions of $57,544 were made in medical insurance and heart and hypertension, bringing the total benefits to $6,896,854, which reflects a change from last year of $98,653 or a 1.45% increase. Thus, the total operating budget being presented to you this evening by the Board of Selectmen reflects an increase of $692,064, which represents the 2.5% increase over this current budget year. At this point, I would like to detail some of the increases in the department budget. Our major increase is the salaries and reserves 
of 2.77% or $382,000 over the current year. This includes all negotiated salary increases and reserved for current contracts yet to be settled. Employee benefits increased by $98,653 due to increase in medical benefits and a decrease of our pension costs. Operating expenses increased by 1.22% or $70,131 over the current year. This includes all expenses other than salaries, such as insurance, utilities, maintenance, fuel, and supply. Capital expenses increased by $140,000 in order to fund various infrastructure improvements and to replace aging equipment. The pension budget has decreased again by $162,504 or a 6.9% increase from the current year. We are seeing the positive results of our efforts to stabilize the pension costs and our commitment to contribute the full amount of the pension contribution recommended by our actuaries. In fact, the, uh, the 2017 pension contribution has decreased over 1.8 million or 56% since 2015. The funded levels of the pension plan have increased to 87.8% for the town plan and 88.7% for the police retirement fund. In addition, through collective bargaining, the costly lump sum provision has been eliminated and the defined benefit plan is now close, close to all new hires. This pension budget also includes projected funding of $84,000 $948 to the new defined contribution plan, or what we like to call a 401A. The last piece of the operating budget is the general fund capital. This year we have increased it from $1,020,130 in fiscal year 2016 to $1,160,000. Dollars, nine hundred sixty-two dollars. Excuse me, for fiscal year 2017, which is an increase of one hundred forty thousand eight hundred thirty dollars, or thirteen point eight one percent. And I call your attention to that, my famous bar chart up there. Since um, 2011, you can see the progression that we have continually put money into this uh, capital funding, as a, or we like to call it a pay-as-you-go, for our capital uh, equipment and uh, infrastructure projects. Some of the projects that are going to be funded uh, by our capital expenditures are projects for communications, reconstruction of sidewalks, which I think was mentioned earlier, road reconstruction, public works equipment, uh, fire equipment, uh, IT equipment, uh, library repairs, uh, natural resources uh, that would be uh, some equipment for them and some uh, vehicle there, uh, park and rec uh, vehicles and equipment, police uh, equipment, which would be mostly uh, vehicles and the uh, new IT equipment for them, and the uh, town property equipment. This slide I put in here is basically to show you what we have bonded since 2011. And you can see here the, the bonding over the years in 2011 and 2017 has gone the other way from what we've spent in our operating budget. And I want to show you the next slide. If we put the two slides together, it's a little hard to see, but I think you get the picture, is that the bonding has been decreased and the, the funding through our operating uh, accounts have increased and gone the other way. So you get the general idea that what we're trying to do here as we go on is that we're going to increase our funding as pay as you go and decrease what we're going to ask the taxpayers to fund on the so-called credit card. As we continue to increase our capital operating expenses each year, we decrease our reliance on long-term bonding 
to finance these major purchases and improvements. Our objective is to control future interest costs by decreasing the amount of debt we incur and fund capital projects on stage and other basis. As we recap the town budget from 2013 through the proposed 2017 budget, we demonstrate we continue to reduce our operating budget as outlined on this slide here. If you look at this from 2013 to now 2017, uh, we've increased the, our amount of increases in our operating costs. I'm going to draw your attention to 2016. Keep in mind that uh, this includes a debt service cost for both the school and town projects. Please note that the 2016 was an anomaly. This was, was the year that the contribution to the pension plan was substantially reduced. Uh, on the recommendation of our actuaries, last year we had a, a gift of a reduction of $1.4 million. You might remember that. I guess. But the point here is that each year we have reduced our uh, operating expenses uh, to run the town. The total budget for the fiscal year 2017 is 94485 uh, uh, dollars, uh, the Board of Education comprises 62% of the total budget, the town is 30% of the total, and debt service is 8%. Now, in my opinion, the debt service comprises both uh, town and uh, school projects, including the Guilford High School. The town has always appropriately managed its debt service, taking advantage of opportunities to refinance and restructure existing debt analyzing scenarios for new debt in order to minimize the burden of debt service on our taxpayers while considering the impact of the bonds for the new Gilbert High School. We now have an opportunity to serve, to save approximately $1 million by refinancing $50 million on existing bonds. Debt service on the new bonds will be structured in such a way that the savings will be spread over the next few years to help offset some of the increase from the new Guilford High School bonds. Remember, like I said at our, uh, our hearings with the department heads, that this was going to be a difficult year for debt service. So to mitigate uh, some of the debt service fight, we're going to refinance uh, $15 million of our debt next week, as a matter of fact. Uh, the debt service budget for 2017 reflects the principal and interest on $56.3 million of the new high school bonds. This includes interest of payments on $15.2 million of bonds expected to be issued in August of 2016. A quick review shows the growth of the grand list of almost 0.8% over the grand list of October 2014. In assessed dollars, this equates to an, an increase of almost $24 million in value, which can be attributed to successful efforts in economic development, including projects as DDR as Guilford Commons and tractor supply, and amongst others. At the current mill rate, is 20, at 24, 24 mills, which is our current mill rate, this would bring an additional $680,000 of tax revenue, which the finance director has figured in to the proposed property taxes of $87 million you see up there. The revenue budget has increased by 1.47%, uh, not only because of the increase in the grand list, but also because of the increase in state funds from the municipal revenue sharing program, or MRSA, which is funded by 5.5% of the state sales tax, the increase in state sales tax. Because of the growth of both the grand list and the additional sales tax, the projected mill rate increase will be at least projected of 2.86%. That will be your tax increases. Okay. The continued growth in our unassigned fund balance or rainy day fund demonstrates our prudent financial management and the diligence with which our 
department heads continually monitor their respective budgets. In addition, we have attained a AAA rating from Standards and Four, who recognizes our outstanding financial management, budgetary practices, and good financial policies. We have also been recognized for our zero-based budgeting approach and conservative management style. We have attained this while making improvements to our infrastructure, such as reconstruction and elevation of roads, particularly in our coastal areas and replacing our aging equipment with more efficient and reliable equipment that has given us the availability to provide better service to our citizens. As always, the town remains prepared for the unexpected, and we always are ready to answer the call in any emergency. I wish to extend my appreciation and gratitude to Selectman Balistrasi, Selectman Haberman, and Selectman McKellen for their support of this budget. I would also like to thank the Finance Department, especially Director Sheila Milano, the staff of the Selectman's Office, particularly Karen Kirchner, and of course the department heads and the board of commission for their hard work and cooperation and in the preparation of this budget, and the Board of Finance for their participation and attendance in the budget hearings. And I want to thank you all for your to answer any questions. Yeah. Uh, so the, the new mill rate will be 31.32? No. No. Oh, that's a percentage. Percentage, that's what it is. Okay, yeah. right. Uh, yeah, the, the mill rate could, could, could change between, and I know we're a little uh, premature in putting a mill rate out in front of the public that was primarily for the, the digest where we were. I just um, gave you that, yeah. Yeah, and, and I had shared with, uh, with this right. board last night the, 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 uh, the mill rate calculation sheets. I just gave you an increase. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, get back into that number. A yeah. couple of guys here can do that kind of yeah. math. Um, but anyway, um, there are some things that could change if something yeah. happens in Hartford relative to anticipated revenues. Um, or something comes up between now and the time that we you know, have to deliberate, uh, it could change. But uh, I think what's important to note is that you you just talked about a 2.8 percent, 2.86 percent tax increase. I dare say that five years ago, uh, when we went to the public uh, to approve the new high school, uh, we had projections uh, that were significantly higher than that. Uh, and there's been the, an alignment. There's been a, a couple of things that have happened here. One, uh, what I, what I have seen demonstrated this evening, which is tremendous discipline in operating budgets and building an operating, uh, operating budget this year, on both sides, the uh, board of education as well as the board of selectmen. Uh, we saw some grand, some real grand list growth for the first time in a little while. Um, Hard as it is to believe, given what's going on in Hartford, what we read, we're anticipating additional state revenues based on some changes they made to some of the formulas last year. Yeah, there were some some areas where mm -hmm. we're going to lose some money, but overall, it's a net it's a net gain. Uh, we continue to see uh, some um, some savings relative to our decisions on how we've invested in pension over time. Um, and quite honestly, if you did, two months ago. If somebody had told me that this was what the number was going to be, I would have suggested that perhaps I could share some of what they were smoking or drinking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, however, uh, again, I think it, uh, it just bears repeating that um, I'm very pleasantly surprised by where we are uh, at this time with this budget with a 40% increase, which could have been higher, 40% increase in debt service. Yeah, and I'd like to. Uh, also say that uh, a couple of factors, if I can. Uh, on the town side, if I will, uh, the department heads did an excellent job. And, and you were all there. We were there. So. You were all there. The department heads did an excellent job in, in hearing what I had to say uh, in the situation that we were facing with the increase in the debt service. It, it, it was not made up. Everybody had seen what the finance director had, had said, we, where we were going to be. And look, next year we're going to be in that same spot. Okay. So they, they came in and with their commissions uh, and boards came in with 
very, very reasonable budgets. There was some uh, concern and talk that about increasing uh, staff in certain areas, and we said, no, we can't do it, and they understood, and there was no really argument about it. They truly understood where the town was, and they gave them a lot of credit for not giving any arguments about it, number one. And they're still going to provide the town with the same level of excellent service that they've always provided the town with. They, they just know how to do it, number one. Uh, I think the finance director was very, very creative in looking where we could uh, mitigate some of the debt service by uh, using some of the premium dollars that we had in reserve on uh, the round of uh, funding we did in 2014 for the new high school, and using some of that, and then looking and saying, hey, we could refinance $15 million of some of this old debt, which we're going to do next week. So we're going to save about a million dollars in interest, but we're not using it all here. We're going to spread it out. That's the point I wanted you to talk to. Over the next couple of years, because we, you know, we don't know where we're going to be next couple of years. We don't know where the state's going to be with the funding. Uh, all our efforts in economic development paid off now, but that's this year. The grant list is not going to grow 0.8% uh, every year. We've got some very good projects that are going to come about. Hopefully next year we'll have another bump. I'm not going to say where it's going to be, but you know, don't know what can happen. But we hope it's going to be. And the last piece is that uh, the state funding, for the first time, uh, the MRSA funding is going to hit in 2017. That's the municipal revenue sharing, or the 0.5% of the increase in the sales tax. I was at a uh, cost annual meeting this morning. It's a council, Connecticut Council of Small Towns, where uh, Senator Lamuni was on a panel, and uh, uh, Speaker Sharkey, uh, Senator Pisano, and, uh, and uh, Minority Leader, uh, leader uh, uh, Demis Clarence for that. They all said, this was this morning, they all <laughs> said you, you can count on the MRSA fund. Right. Now, when they end in May, we'll see you at that. <laughs> but, you know, we're putting our budget together before that. So. Right. So all of that came together, which it's lot for a while, I don't know. But I think a lot of it was hard work and dedication in a lot of areas. Yes, right. hey, just I want to follow up on the MRSA thing. Um, is it, correct me if I'm wrong, but the MRSA was implemented last year as a result of some changes they made relative to the um, cap on a mill rate for auto automobile taxes, That's which correct. is at what currently set at 32, yeah. I believe statewide, right. uh, that you know anybody above that um, had to freeze their, their, their rate at 32, and the state was going to reimburse mm -hmm. uh, municipalities uh, in, a, in some formula. Uh, and in the law of unintended consequences, um, a community like Guilford who does not receive much state funding anywhere other than ECS, uh, winds, up, winds up getting uh, an additional six hundred or $700,000 from uh, that MRSA uh, when you normally wouldn't think we would get that kind right. of money. Uh, so it, it, yes, it is, it is found money. It's, it, yeah. it's wonderful. And the, the fact that we're able to keep our mill rate increase at the level it's at gives us some cap room over the next several years before we have to worry about bumping up against that 32 mil cap that the state has. And it's my understanding that the state will probably wind up having to adjust that cap well, over time. Well, see, that, that's the cap on the, um, the uh, automobile cap. Tax, just okay. the automobile tax. But, but then there's the spending cap. Yeah. The two spending cap has a 2.5%. Right. Okay, now, if you exceed that, there's a penalty that you pay. The penalty is in form of not getting all of the mercy money. Right. But here's, here's the rub, is that uh, it's not clear. If debt service is included. 
Well, debt service is not exclusive. So what we, what we got to do is reduce, reduce that from the equation. But it's not clear, even with the legislators, if you are a town that your budget is approved at town meeting or referendum, if you have, have to, to abide by that cap. Abide by the cap. But they haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> because the argument is, hey, if our vote is saying that we can raise taxes 6%, why are you, right. the state, telling our voters what to do? There's a lot of lobbying to move. That's out. right. I'll be meeting in, in Sharkey's office tomorrow. CAPS is, is right. lobbying really hard to have that change. One, because it's so confusing. And two, because of exactly what you just said. Exactly. So uh, the argument is, uh, don't tell us or tell our voters what they want, and then you're going to penalize them because they want to do, they want to uh, revitalize or you know their whole fleet, or they want to hire ten more public works guys because they need them to plow the roads and fix the roads. They're willing to pay for them, so they'll penalize them by taking away state funding. So that hasn't been clear. Yeah. When, when, it, when, it, when that legislation was passed last year, I found it somewhat amusing that they would find it within themselves to restrict our spending to 2.5% when they couldn't do it in their own house. Well, that, that was a whole argument this morning. <laughs> yes. I mean, they no, couldn't they, do it in their own house. So. After, after that session, I, I felt they were going to take all the money away because they really earned it from us. <laughs> <I know. laughs> But anyway, uh, I think we'll save questions, uh, specific questions for the budget. Uh, and not to say that the process is done. I, I, I want people in the audience to understand the process is not done. Um, we have uh, in front of us, well, we have a couple of weeks, so we can roll this over uh, and, and take a look at the changes that have been made. And there have been substantial changes to both budgets since we saw them in, in uh, January. Uh, but we will have the opportunity on uh, March 8th, uh, we'd love you in the viewing audience will have the opportunity on March 8th to uh, hear this presentation once again at the annual Board of uh, Finance's uh, budget public hearing. Um, and it is important to note that, uh, as is the case in all Board of Finance meetings, there will be an opportunity for public input. Uh, public forum uh, will be, it, it is an integral, integral part of that presentation. We'll see the presentations you've just seen mm -hmm. uh, presented to us. Um, we will uh, open it up for questions from uh, folks in the audience who decide to come out, uh, and also probably questions from the board, the board members or, ourselves. And then folks will have the opportunity to express an opinion on uh, what they have seen, what has been presented, and their position on whether or not uh, the budget should be supported. Uh, we'll follow that up with a uh, Board of Finance workshop on uh, Thursday, March 10th. Uh, where it is my hope that uh, we can pass, uh, we can we can uh, come to a vote and pass a budget on to uh, to referendum, and might as well take the opportunity to say the referendum this year is scheduled for April 12th, I believe. Matt, there's one thing I just want to uh, mention that summarize. Um, it's, it's good a job as the, the departments did in putting their budgets together. The board of selectmen still reduce the budget that was submitted by four hundred to twenty one thousand dollars. Agreed. Okay. Yeah you guys you guys did some work. Sheila? Oh I, I just wanted to, to say that the referendum is actually uh, the nineteenth. So the nineteenth change. Okay. Well then it is I stand corrected. The referendum is now uh, April nineteenth. Uh, it's a Tuesday right and I, yes. I guess there's a revised revised one because I have the revised for later. And, and the budget, to this point of people coming to the budget uh, uh, workshops, the budget's available online? Yep. Okay. And um, it's... Uh, people. So we get it out right there. Okay. It will be available. Yeah. It will be. Okay. And Joe, uh, could you send, uh, send us copies of your presentation yep. as well? Yep. That would be helpful. Okay. Well, the budget is on the Board of Ed's website. Full right. details, same information that you have. So the Board of Ed's budget will be on the Board of Ed. Website as well. Very good. So that information is out there or will promptly be out there? Yeah, what we'll do is the uh, letter, transmittal letter that I did not read. Right. Can you put that on the website? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.
All right, we're back to our agenda committee reports. Mike, is there anything in the high school building committee? Um, I checked in last week, and it's just a matter of site work being completed, finishing up, and wait for spring to uh, finish off a lot of the final work. Okay. Um, but nothing, it's just, at this point, it's just uh, paying the bills and finalizing, getting ready for audit. Uh, old business? I have one. What would that be? It's old and new. <laughs> It falls in between, so it's 10A? Uh, it, it has to do with the um, eminent domain issue okay. that we addressed a month or so ago at a meeting. I was at a special meeting held by the Board of Selectmen a couple of weeks ago, um, and one of the items on the agenda was to discuss and take possible action to waive the requirement of three estimates and or bidding for the hiring of a title searcher and a surveyor for the acquisition of necessary easements for the water main project. And Ms. Millman, um, at the meeting, so Ms. Millman said, at the end of the meeting in November, the Board of Finance voted to recommend the Board of Selectmen pursue all the easements. She added, these are from the minutes of the special meeting. She added that they are following up on the Board of Finance's motion, trying to get all the easements at once and avoid an eminent domain situation. Ms. Millman said they will hold the easements in escrow until all the other steps of the project are completed. Mr. McKenzie said the Board of Finance made no such recommendation. Um, there's a little bit of a bait and switch going on, and you are all certainly entitled to view it however you want. What I approved. Um, if, if you go back to the minutes of the meeting and the motion that we made, um, first of all, I think everybody on this board, uh, well, I know because we all voted not to recommend the initiation of eminent domain, but a number of us um, were concerned that a number of steps hadn't been thoroughly taken, vetted, um, some having to do with environmental implications, some having to do with the number of people who were actually interested in the project, some having to do with cost some having to do with some suggestions from prior studies that had, we learned had not been undertaken. Um, and Mike, Mr. Ailes in particular, was um, is mentioned in here several times. And I think we were all pretty much in agreement with to what we wanted to, what we thought needed to be done. So the motion that was made by Mr. Hoey and was seconded by myself um, was to not recommend the initiation of eminent domain to acquire an easement from India Cove Association. Uh, the board recommends to the Board of Selectmen to attempt to obtain all the necessary easements for the proposed water main project and hold the same in escrow, conditioned upon eventual acquisition of the Indian Cove Association easement by negotiation for purchase or otherwise. Now, what has happened, so when I voted on this, I was referring to specifically the Fisher easement that was, is needed. And the reason we were before eminent, uh, the eminent domain issue came up was because there's a stretch of property on Lower Road which is was at the time believed to be owned by the Indian Cove Association. And that was an easement that they were trying to get ease, to take through eminent domain. And so when we said get the easements, one of the things we thought this was putting the cart before the horse, and one of those said items was obtaining these easements. We said, we're not going to allow eminent domain until you've done some of these other steps, and one of them is getting the necessary easements. Well, the path that is now being pursued is there seems to be some um, belief that Indian Cove doesn't actually own that piece of road. <laughs> and so the easement is not actually needed. Um, from for that stretch of property that they were trying to enforce them in a domain. So in order to do this, and I don't know where this came from, but this is where I'm going with all of this. Um, so the title searches, I'm not, I'm, I don't love the idea that, that, that we waive the competitive bidding for a lot of these projects that we do in town. I think competitive bidding is an important process that um, we should do. Um, but you know, there was a cogent reason for not doing it in this particular situation. Um, so again, to, I did not authorize the town to pay monies to do title searches to determine who owns 
that property. I think that the parties involved in that, but perhaps the town should do it, but at this board meeting, at least I, as a member of the Board of Finance, I was under the impression that the easements that we were talking about were the other ones, and that Indian Cove actually owned this stretch of land. So I don't want to be put in a position of saying that I sided with some small special interest group that's trying to push this through more quickly because I believe that is what is uh, is trying to take to, to what is uh, being attempted here. Um, and it's if that's if it works that way, fine. But I just want people to know that certainly me and I think I speak for some of at least some of you when we recommended the motion that we did, we didn't anticipate and we didn't anticipate that that piece of property may not actually be owned by the people we thought owned it. And so we're not saying that we are siding with another approach, basically. Yeah, Ken, Ken thanks for bringing it up. That is an interesting development. Um, and I, I agree with you. I think the thrust, whether the, whether the words clearly reflected it or not in the motion, but I think we all felt that eminent domain was premature until we had all the other easements locked up. It didn't, as you said, the cart before the horse. And uh, you know we were operating on the assumption that Indian Cove Association uh, was somebody that we needed to negotiate with eventually, but not until such time as we had everything else lined up would we entertain in the domain. Right, and we, but uh, and, um, as an addendum, I for one don't want to be construed as siding with perhaps a small group, a less than the 75 percent of individuals that are trying to push this thing through in a more rapid manner, right. and if they're able to do so. Through, through whatever means they do, that's their you know, Right, I, 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 I'm not, I don't have any culpability in that. Agreed, agreed. And I, I think what this board effectively did with the motion and the decision we made was to push this back into the Board of Selectmen's, uh, into the Board of Selectmen's purview, um, where, quite honestly, I, I thought it, it belonged, but because our charter required us to act on it, we wound up deliberating on something that Joe and I would agree to years ago would have been overstepping our bounds when uh, we were in there, but we were forced into doing it. So uh, your point is your point's well taken, um, and I had anticipated, but that at some point the town would most likely be expending some funds to get to some resolution. This, whether it was doing more studies, as we have been uh, as we have been told was going to happen at one point, or whether it was engaging. Uh, the, you know, the attorneys, the outside attorneys that we had, uh, again, for negotiation purposes. Uh, I'm not sure uh, a title search is outside of the realm of reasonability to satisfy the overall project, the overall concerns of that project, because I think that's what we said. We said, go back and fix it, or try to fix it, however that, however that turns out to be. So. No, to the town's credit, they are posting it. You can see the updated progress on the okay. website. Yeah. Joe, did you want to come in? I, just a point of clarification, um, we have hired Norm Church okay. um, Nor Nor to uh, be the attorney, okay. uh, and he has uh, uh, suggested that we do a complete survey and title searches okay. for all of these uh, properties that we need easements on, and he's in the process of doing that, which we have to do anyway. I mean, it's not just one easement. There are a bunch of them. Including, and so, including the uh, Mulberry Point one? Yeah. yeah that's right. Yeah, Mulberry Point, the, the Fishers. Yeah. Uh, there's a bunch of little ones we have to do. So we're in the process of doing that. Uh, and when we attain these easements, they'll be held in escrow until the project uh, is finally approved. And then the cost of obtaining all these easements, including with the church's fees, will be part of the project cost, which then will be paid for by the people who will benefit by having the water. Fair enough. Okay. But in the meantime, we got to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. All right. Ken, thanks for bringing that up. But Ken is right. Um, Dennis Johnson, who's in charge of the project, posts uh, periodic updates on the website. On the website. Okay. Any other old business? I have a piece of old business. Well, new business, actually. You sure? Yes. Is <laughs> it hat? It is fully new. <laughs> so you already outlined for the old business. So no, okay, we'll call it new. So CCM, as you guys 
probably, probably no, and probably get a fair amount of um, emails and other communications as various topics. Um, and this was this was very helpful. Um, FOIA, there's, there's, there's spreadsheets here on FOIA obligations, proper meeting notices, proper meeting um, disclosures, document disclosures, which frankly town staff for the most part takes care of. Uh, and there's there's also a section on here, parliamentary procedure, which gets a little detailed, but nonetheless, um, is something handy. That probably has a book that has been handed down through the generations. If I want. It is in here somewhere. Yeah, so but, um, anyway, I hand it on. Here we go. It's right. a useful tool. The parliamentary you. procedure at a glance. And, uh, and usually, I, I must admit closed. that in 22 plus years of sitting uh, in this chair and then 24 plus on the table, I thank God never had to do this. But Lou, since you have shown such interest <laughs> in parliamentary procedures by attending this training and bringing us this documentation, I'd like you to ponder over the next month whether or not you accept an appointment as parliamentarian of this board. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to take a couple months to think that <laughs> But th thank you for, for sharing this. And uh, there are some, there, there, the CCM does provide plenty it's of useful. And I must tell you, the FOIA, the, the, the one takeaway is that you can, you can stumble into a meeting right. um, without uh, necessarily knowing it. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And everybody needs to be on guard with that. And, Email is, is definitely one way that, that a lot of places, and I must tell you, there were 30 towns represented at this meeting. It was pretty impressive. Right. They had a pretty good turnout. And it was clear that some of those towns do not have the uh, collegial um, exchange of information that occurs here and, you know, different departments fighting and different boards fighting and battles over documents and, and different things. So. Anyway, yeah, to, to the you need to be cautious, and it's the public. The bottom line is, we're doing the public's business. It's the public's information. So, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Anything else in the business? Well, uh, I haven't seen anybody from the public show up since. We <laughs> <laughs> uh, you lose a few minutes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.